hello. I always get so excited to sit down and film my wrap up videos for you guys that I never stop talking. So if you are new here today, what I tend to do is talk about everything I read in the month and I start with my least favorite book of the month and work my way up to my favorite book of the month. I will tell you guys that ranking them in that particular order was rather difficult this month. So let's talk first about some reading statistics for the month of June. Overall, I was really pleased with my reading month for the most part in June. I read some things that I felt just okay about, which led me to DNF some other things, but overall I did read a lot of things I really liked this month. I did read quite a bit. So in the month of June, I read a total of 10 books and two manga. Seven of these books were fantasy and three were sci-fi. Nine of the books were adult and one fell into the middle grade age range. Six of the books were completed through ebook or physical paperback and four of the books I listened to via audiobook. So when it comes to star rating, I did not rate one of the books and this doesn't include my manga, I had one one star read, one 3.5 star read, one 3.75 star read, two 4.25 star reads, two 4.75 star reads, and two five star reads. So a lot fell within that four to five range, so that's looking pretty good. The average rating for a month was a 4.02 out of five stars, so you can't complain. That's doing pretty well overall. When it comes to the amount of pages I read, once again, this doesn't include graphic novels or manga. I listened to 2,060 pages via audiobook format, and I read 3,031 pages physically through ebook or paperback for a total of 5,091 pages completed this month, which is significantly higher than the last couple of months. I listened to more audiobooks and physically read more books. I think that some of this probably has to do with my digital minimalism lifestyle changes that I've incorporated and I'm really happy with it. I just really felt like reading a lot and so I allowed myself to do so. Average length of a book I read, I suppose if you do the math, is about 509 pages. And now when it comes to author gender, nine of the books I read this month were from male authors and only one from a female author, which is a bit sad. So 90% was male authors, but as I'm completing the series I'm in the midst of, you guys know this will be the case. So overall, statistically, pretty good reading month. Now let's get into the books. If you guys have seen my reading vlog, it will be no surprise to you that the book I enjoyed the least in the month of June is The Midnight Library by Matt Haig, which I rated a one out of five stars. So I think that someone's enjoyment of this book will vary greatly depending on your personal life experiences. However, for me, this just completely rubbed me the wrong way because the subject matter is something so close to me. I was personally offended by the way the author handled it. So what we have here is a very short exploration of suicide where we explore this library that people go to between life and death after someone tries to commit suicide. And we get to open these books and see all of the paths that one could have taken throughout their life to basically go over their regrets. I wish I hadn't done this. I wish I hadn't done that. And see what life would have been like had you made different choices. It sounds like a cool enough concept. However, it completely missed the mark for me. What's bizarre is I love this author's other book, The Humans, and he is somebody who writes self-help books. He has been open about suffering with depression. However, to me, this book read as though it was written by somebody who's never experienced suicide or depression in their entire lives. There's a couple reasons why I rated this a one out of five stars. So the first thing is that the main character did not whatsoever come across as somebody who was wanting to end their life. I've been there. I know a lot of people who have been there and I didn't find it believable. I did not see any of the thoughts that seemed like our character was actually at a place of no longer wanting to live. I didn't buy that. And I might have enjoyed this more if I felt like she was at that stage of 
depression or turmoil where she couldn't live another day with herself. The other thing is, this is not a spoiler in my opinion, and I'd rather tell you guys so you know in advance, but the way the author handled it is basically, if you just try hard enough, then you'll be happy. And while trying to be happy does significantly increase your chances of being happy, it's not a cure for suicide or depression by any means. And I feel like it was not handled properly where I'm saying if I had read this when I was in the stage of wanting to end my life I would have been like well I guess I'm just not trying hard enough another thing I'm failing at I might as well not live add another reason to the list of something I'm failing at and that's just completely not the case the other thing is basically a lot of it related back to love being the reason to continue living and that's just preposterous to me while love is an important part of our lives it's unfair to say that somebody should base their reason for living upon love from other people because once again that's depending on your happiness from another person he didn't just use romantic love which I was happy with he said like sibling love familial love friendship love but some people are isolated I'm not speaking from experience I have lots of people whom I love and who love me in my life but I just think it's very sad and if somebody's feeling isolated and doesn't have a lot of friends or family I think this could be very harmful so I will cap it there. Those were my main reasons. But like I said, I don't recommend this book to anyone. I do not recommend this book, especially if you are suffering with depression or ever having suicidal thoughts or going through a rough time. I think it would be quite harmful. I think that maybe the people that enjoy this book possibly have never been to that dark place. And that's a very broad statement of of course it's not everyone. I know there are people who have told me personally that they enjoyed this and they have suffered with depression, but I think that this is more so a book that just kind of paints this gloss over what suicide and depression is in a way that is digestible and nice enough and neat enough for the mass public to sort of try to understand. But depression and anxiety and suicide is not nice. It is not pretty. It is messy and is hurtful and it is painful. And this book didn't go through any of that. So I'm done with it. <laughs> like I said, I don't recommend this to anybody. If you were able to get something out of this and enjoy it, then I'm happy for you. But I'm not going to quiet my voice down about how problematic I think this book is. I think I had read a Goodreads review and I said in my vlog, it's like cheap Tumblr poetry on the subject of suicide. I know you had good intentions, but it makes me not want to pick up anything from this author again. Next up is The Silmarillion by Tolkien, which I listened to the audiobook for this one, which tremendously helped me. The audiobook narrator did a phenomenal job. I am putting this, yes, second on the books that I enjoyed least for the month. It's not the book's fault, it's my fault, and I just want to be very clear with that. I was not in the mood for this type of book. Don't let people fool you. If you are amongst the masses and not the very few individuals who enjoy history textbooks or things written in that format, it will read like the Bible. It will read like a history book to you. <laughs> and you need to know that going into it. I know that I'm not the only one. Lots and lots of us have struggled through reading this and I did finish it, but I'm not sure I even should have at the time being. It was very dense. It was a lot, but there's a couple things I do want to add to that. One, per usual, the prose is stunning. Okay. The way that it was written, the fairy tale-esque writing style that he has is stunning and I would listen to it before bed oftentimes and it's just it feels like someone's reading you a fairy tale before bed. So the writing is beautiful and the ideas, the world building, the epic scale of how this world came to be, the rich history, it's brilliant. 
So for me, the reason that I didn't enjoy it as much right now is I don't think that I should have tried to read this in one month. I think I should have just picked it up, gave my attention to a chapter at a time for as long as it possibly took me to get through to fully enjoy it. Because as I said, the stories and the ideas are wonderful. It was just so much. I'm lost. I could tell you like two things that happened. At the beginning, I was really doing well and about like a third of the way through, I was just like, there are so many names and places and I cannot keep track of all of it. So many of the names sound the same and I just felt so overwhelmed. I needed like spreadsheets, I needed timelines, I needed family trees and charts. <laughs> I would have loved all of those supplemental things to help me get through this book. So that's why I'm not rating it. I did not rate it on Goodreads. I'm not rating it here because I don't think that's fair because as I said, I probably should have DNF'd it, set it aside until I was in the mood to go through something this dense rather than trying to make myself finish it. However, I'm glad that I read it once, but it is something that I will absolutely return to in the future without a doubt. I'm excited to re-experience it, having known what I know now and just being able to take it slowly. And that's my best advice for you. Don't put any time limit on when you finish this. Just take it chapter by chapter whenever you feel like picking it up. How sad is it, guys, that our year of the Lord of the Rings five full months of Tolkien books is over. I do want to say though, I definitely have plans to read more of his shorter stories or other works that are not part of the Lord of the Rings. I'm really excited to pick up more by Tolkien. So I definitely plan to in the future once I've finished with a couple of these major series that I'm reading. The next book that I didn't love in the month of June is Knife of Dreams by Robert Jordan, the 11th book in the Wheel of Time series, and it is the final novel that he finished before he passed. I gave this a 3.5 out of 5 stars. It was a perfectly fine book, and I'm not going to say too much about it. Once again, if you guys have been keeping up with my vlogs, then you'll probably know a lot more of my in-depth thoughts about this series so far. I am finishing it just for the sake of curiosity at this point. I freaking hope it ends well, okay? But this is a three and a half star book for me and that's what scares me because I know this is a favorite for a lot of people. I truly just think that maybe that is skewed based on how bad books eight, nine, and ten were. I'm not certain if it is your favorite book in the world. I, I am not trying to take any enjoyment away from you. There's just nothing that Robert Jordan does that is what I am looking for when I'm reading. I find myself very annoyed throughout the majority of the book because of certain tropes he relies upon, certain relationship aspects. Um, frankly, his writing puts me to sleep. So while I think that Robert Jordan's ideas are brilliant. I love the world that he has created. I love the magic and some of the characters. I love the scope of everything that's going on. But in my opinion, the delivery completely misses the mark. And it makes me want to tear my hair out sometimes because I don't care about 75% of what Robert Jordan is deciding to tell us about. And if he spent more time focusing on the cool things that he has, these brilliant ideas that he has, then I would enjoy it more. I don't think that should shock any of you at this point when you see what type of books are my favorite books, the things I really gravitate towards. Robert Jordan doesn't really fall into that category and I am by no means saying it's a fault of his or that his writing is bad. It's just not what I wanna choose to read about. It is not what appeals to me. And that's why there's a million different authors and books because there's something for everyone and this is just not it for me. I am I'm so bored and so annoyed throughout most of my time reading it. I've forgotten so many things that have happened from Knife of Dreams already and I just read it in June. So I'm going to need to read a chapter summary before I move on next month in August and hopefully read two more of the books then because I will finish it. So that's enough of that. One of the middle of the road books that I finished this month is part of a series I adore and that is Babylon's Ashes by James S.A. Corey, which is the sixth book in the Expanse series. I gave this a 3.75 out of five stars. So it was still a great installment in this sci-fi 
space opera world and I adore this series. The reason that I did end up lowering my rating is because the things that we focus on in this particular installment are not the things I love reading about. So my enjoyment decreased because of that. So the fifth book, Nemesis Games, appeals so much to me. It was my favorite in the whole series so far because it was so rich in character development, in following these characters' backstories and learning about their relationships while there were your typical sci-fi elements and a little bit of action. Now the difference is this is for my action lovers. So if you love action scenes and battle and fighting and preparing the ships and hearing about exactly how the ships will engage in these battle tactics, this is going to be for you, my friend. So it was very heavily focused upon that to the point where I found myself not caring through a lot of those scenes. And that's, once again, not the book's fault. It's just not what I love to read about. So it wasn't my favorite installment. I did say in one of my vlogs, I did start the TV show for this. Just barely got into it. I'm really looking forward to watching more, but I cannot wait to continue on with this series. The characters are so strong in this sci-fi setting is what really, really makes me drawn to this because we get that perfect mixture most times. And I think there's a good variety within the book series as well. There's something for everyone and there are installments that focus more on different types of the plot or characters or battle and action, things like that to where there's variety and it doesn't feel the same and monotonous throughout the whole time. So like I said, it really was a me problem, not the book problem, but I definitely still enjoyed my time reading it and I'm very much looking forward to Persepolis Rising as soon as I can get to it because I'm dying to know what happens next. One of the next books that I absolutely adored this month, I actually rated a five out of five stars. So it's weird that it's in the middle, but that is When You Trap a Tiger by Tay Keller. And this is a middle grade fantasy novel. I'm just noticing it looks like it says John Newbery Medal for the most distinguished contribution to American literature for children. It should win an award. This is a fantasy based on Korean mythology where we have some smaller magical elements that are fun. Our main character and her sister and her mother are on the way to go meet and live with their Helmani. I'm also probably saying that wrong, so I apologize if I am, but their grandmother to live with her. And so they have to uproot their lives and move from, I think, California to... Washington. It's really a book focusing on these familial relationships, watching this main character and how she interacts with her sister, the relationship developments there with her mother and with her grandmother and how they work as a family. So it is exploring some magical elements because they think their grandmother is a little bit off because she always talks about these magical things and they just kind of roll her their eyes at her and laugh. But then our main character sees this tiger in the middle of the road on the trip to go see their grandmother. So she's wondering, can I see magic too? What's happening? I need to talk to my grandmother about this and figure it out. But really the heart of the story is the relationships between these four ladies in the family. This is a very deep and heavy middle grade story. It's very emotional, very touching and impactful, way more so than I expected it to be. Like it was pretty hard hitting because we are dealing with things like dementia and death. I think it's a very important story for middle grade age children. So if you you have a child in that age range or you're like me and you love middle grade then I really recommend picking this up because it was such a heartwarming beautiful story that was I wouldn't say fun to read it's not a happy-go-lucky middle grade story but there were laughable and funny moments mixed within these important themes so I gave this a five out of five stars. I very much recommend it if you're looking for a new middle grade. The next one that I read and loved is The Girl and the Mountain by Mark Lawrence. This is a sequel to The Girl and the Stars that I read last year. And this is the prequel trilogy to his book of the Ancestor trilogy, beginning with Red Sister. I'll talk about that book in another video because I started rereading it in June. I cannot tell you how much I prefer this trilogy to the Red Sister trilogy. There's some things that you should know going into it though. I'm not going to talk about what the plot of this really is because it's a sequel, but these books really establish the world of 
where the book of the ancestor takes place so you're getting all of the backstory in history so you don't read these books for the characters the way that you read red sister for the character work this is for the world building this really cool sci fantasy world that mark lawrence has created ideas that i really love we have this mixture of like machines and gods in this arctic ice setting that just works so well we have these basically clans and tribes a very cutthroat brutal world where these kids are basically thrown into this ice pit to see if they'll survive the ones who are ruined or i can't remember what they're called in the first book but we're obviously continuing on with the story here he loves to end these books on cliffhangers um so i am very eagerly anticipating the third and concluding novel in this but basically i would read so much more in this i think the good thing too is that he doesn't waste time there's not filler i mean these this book is under 400 pages and that's all it needed to be i am so over fantasy books that are 900 pages for the sake of being 900 pages it's like we actually didn't need to know all of that this gets right to the point it's very mysterious in this world so everything's not explained perfectly and i don't think that it's meant to be i think it is supposed to have some mystery elements to it but my favorite thing in the world is sci fantasy so the mixture that we get of sci-fi and fantasy in this series is just so well blended the history the world it's just wonderful and i do think that there are some really good friendship elements in this too it doesn't focus on romance it is an adult fantasy novel but the the main characters start out pretty young in the first book and man i recommend the series so much if any of that sounds interesting to you i just like to say those things in advance because if you go into it expecting it to be another red sister book then you're going to be disappointed unless you're me who doesn't like red sister and then you're excited so if you know that you're getting into a sci fantasy world building book with characters kind of on the back burner then i think that you will be pleasantly surprised. And I really wish more people were reading this and talking about it because I have no one to talk about this series with and it really makes me sad. I love it so much. I read so many cold books this month. And if I didn't say I gave that a 4.25 out of five stars, there were just a couple things. I wasn't sure if I was meant to be questioning. Like, I don't know if it was the delivery that was confusion, if I misunderstood or didn't pay attention, or if it was meant to be left unknown. So, and, and there were a couple things, I suppose, that almost felt like plot conveniences, but not in a way that took away from the enjoyment of the overall story, but I didn't want to like overlook them. So I docked a little bit from my star rating for that. Then we have Chapter House Dune, the sixth and concluding novel to the Dune Chronicles by Frank Herbert, which you guys know is my favorite series of all time at this point. It was quite an emotional ending for me because I could tell that Frank Herbert did not want the story to end here. This is not like a definitive conclusion. This does not wrap up the previous five novels. This is not the end. And it's just heartbreaking. I'm sure similar to fans of Robert Jordan with the Wheel of Time series, as you don't get the ending that the author intended. What I am looking forward to is going forward and exploring some of the books that his son, Brian Herbert and Kevin J. Anderson have tried their best to put something out here for fans that his father would approve of. And I know they're not the same, but friends, I am going to read them. I know you guys tell me not to. I think it's funny when people expect every book in a series to be the same thing, um, similar to one of the next books I'm gonna talk about. And especially books written by another author in the same world, of course they're going to be different. It's a different author. If you wanna read the same thing, just keep rereading the same book. I always find that a little bit funny, but I enjoyed this more than Heretics of Dune because we get a more cohesive story following what we started in Heretics of Dune and I really enjoyed some of the new characters or some of the new ideas. There were more cool ideas in this like as far as types of groups of people or different things that just Frank Herbert imagined in this world. Uh, it was pretty brutal and her one character who makes it all the way through this whole series I just 
You guys will never guess who it is. I obviously won't say. But after reading this, I am just dying to go back and reread Heretics of Dune to sort of see where all of this started again because I was thrown for a loop as I started Heretics of Dune. As I said, I think that was the lowest rated Dune book that I had read because I was like, wait, what's going on? But I do know that after I read some of the supplemental books by Brian Herbert and Kevin J. Anderson, it'll fill in some of those gaps to help make more sense. So I may wait to reread them until I've read like, but Marian Jihad and some of the other house books or spin-off books that they have done just to give me more information. I'd read anything. I really need like a Silmarillion for this world. That's what I would love because I could just read so much about it and be fascinated. I don't think I said yet, but I did give this a 4.25 out of five stars. It's not the best in the series, but it was still a solid installment, not a solid concluding novel because it wasn't. But I'm just, I'm still thinking about the ending right now and just like thinking what Frank Herbert would have done with it. So if you guys have completed all six books, please tell me. So I have someone to chat with it about because I don't know anyone really who has completed all six books. You guys just know how much it means to me. I adore these books with all my heart. Okay, the next thing on my list, I actually rated a five out of five stars and that is Dreams of the Dying by Nicholas Liet. So this is a self-published novel. Do yourself a favor and order the hardback because the art is on the naked hardback, but that's not why I loved this book. This is a new start to an adult fantasy series with horror elements. And let me tell you, the mixture was superb. I said that I am most impressed by reading this author for the first time this year. I was blown away by this author's world building. So I'm not somebody who's able to really picture things when I'm reading. For whatever reason, I was able to see exactly where we were at the whole time. He created this extremely rich culture that felt so established and real, like real language and the different types of people and factions within this land. It just felt like something that was already part of our world, but he created all of it. So the world building was excellent. I loved the writing. I think that the plot was very interesting to me. I had never read anything, anything like this before. And I'm not really going to give you any details. Actually, I'm wondering what it says on the back because I at this point I can't remember like what is spoilery or not. I will read you this I guess. I think that that does a really great job describing what this book is about because it really focuses on a couple things. One is this empire crumbling and the discussion of classism is huge. People trying to get to the top by any means necessary, stepping on people, killing people, betraying people, all to create some kind of power. And we take a look at what emotionally that might do to people who have finally gotten to the top. We also take a look at the people who might not have had a lot and can't get out of poverty. So we are dealing with major social issues in a way that a fantasy story really hasn't done, in my opinion, in a unique way that was very impactful and very thought provoking. This was a book that stuck with you, lingered in your mind, made you relate it to our world and I think all of us agreed on that. The social issues were extremely prevalent in this book. The other thing is evaluating your mind. If your mind is the enemy, where do you run? We have a main character who deals with depression, deals with trauma, engages in a lot of self-sabotaging behavior. There are several mentions of suicide throughout this book. So it's definitely a dark story as far as evaluating one's mental health. And I think that this author really wasn't afraid to take it to that next level. And I know that there are some people I read this with that didn't love our main character, but guess what? Like that is what people in this frame of mind can do at times. And I love authors that don't gloss over or try to make the protagonist likable by changing decisions. Sometimes people suck because they have been hurt. And this book sort of explores that at times. We have a character battling through that. And I think that it was done wonderfully. There were so many quotable lines in this book. There were discussions of nihilism and the meaning of life. And if we control our own decisions, there were just so many things that I was able to sit and think about discussions I wanted to have based on this. 
Now, the other thing that made this a five-star read for me is that it had these brilliant horror elements. And sometimes I was like, oh, oh my God, thinking about what the author was describing. He did a beautiful job. Well, beautiful if you like horror like me, describing these really disgusting things in a way that was super creepy or unsettling. It's not a horror book, but it has those small touches of horror elements that I absolutely love in my fantasy books. Fantasy, horror, and sci-fi horror are just the perfect combination. This author is brilliant in my mind. Only in the hardcover, I guess, you get a lot of the hand-drawn illustrations. I mean, there's just pages and pages of things like this. It is absolutely worth your money. And there's uh, like a bestiary and things, all these drawings, journal entries, it's just so much. There's also like a glossary or things about the grammatical structure of the language here, discussing pronouns and all kinds of different things. So much thought and attention to detail went into this book. There was nothing I didn't like about it. This is the first book I finished in the month of June. So sitting here at the very end of June filming this, none of the impact has worn off. And that's not the case sometimes with books that I read that I immediately feel drawn to. The impact lasted and there's nothing I could say that I wish was different or would have been done better. I think it was a phenomenal start to a fantasy series and I absolutely will pre-order whatever this author does next. Hopefully it's the second book in this series and I hope we don't have to wait too long, but this is like my new favorite thing. I absolutely adore it. Five out of five stars. So here's what's weird. I rated this a 4.75 out of five stars and somehow it ended up on the list higher than Dreams of the Dying, but maybe it's because Dreams of the Dying is so heavy that you need a break after reading it because mentally it's very taxing. So are you guys ready for what the next book is? Because I am not if you guys know what popular booktube darling I dislike and then the book that was our patreon buddy read for the month of June that my patrons chose thank you guys for choosing this book or I never would have read it the shadow of the gods by John Gwynn I loved this book I did not give it a full five stars I'm not quite sure why I'm not gonna say too much about the plot of this book it is not a super plot heavy book it is something that really takes its time to weave these three separate stories together. We have Orca, we have Varg, and we have Elvar, and we are following the three of them. Two females, by the way, and a male, one trying to become blood sworn with a mission to find out what happened to his sister, one a mother who encounters um, some people that have been murdered at the beginning, and one, I don't know what the technical word they use was, but she's basically, oh, I can't say that. One independent female elder who is trying to establish who she is and becoming her own person without relying on help from family connections. So this is a Norse inspired fantasy world where we have lots of terms I'm very unfamiliar with. I had to look things up. Sometimes I tried to look things up and I couldn't even find a picture for what the author was describing. So I do think that this would have benefited from having a glossary. I would have shouted with joy if we had a glossary for this book. So basically they're in this world where the gods have died long ago and their bones still like lie in this area. We spend a lot of time throughout the first 75% of this book just getting to know these people, getting to know the land, the area that they're in. And it's really fun to piece together their storylines and see how they are connected. And it was done so beautifully. It wasn't obvious. It wasn't over the top. There were small tedious connections I think the end was definitely like a wow action-packed moment. I guess the reason that I rated this higher on today's ranking list is because this book allowed me to escape every night. I read the physical paperback in bed before bed every night and I was transported to this cold icy world that John Gwen created with these really cool fantasy creatures that are not 
a part of a lot of fantasy books that I read regularly or even if we've seen some of them done before like the trolls they were so different in the way that they were described. Now I have heard some complaints of John Gwynn's writing of this book being a little too overly descriptive. I didn't feel that way personally because it helped me to picture the clothing of these people or the land or the way that they live. The only thing I'm gonna say is thought cage. I'd be okay never hearing that term ever again. Um, but I don't know, maybe it is a Norse inspired word. Maybe that's what they said. I don't know. So I really think that John Gwynn got so much right in this, okay, because he got the, the lore and the mythology right, in my opinion, in a way that made it really neat. He got the world building mostly right. I think that I would have liked a little more time spent on the history of what happened with these old gods because I found that by the time I got to the end of the book, I had sort of forgotten who certain people were because we only got a really small little chunk of what had actually happened in the past. So I do need to go back and reread that still actually, but I, I would have enjoyed a bit more of the history of the world and how it came to be, but the character work was just so good. Like, I was attached to the characters without even knowing that I was attached to the characters. There are certain moments where something happens and you're like, what? Like my patrons, we were doing a reading sprint and they saw me react to a certain scene because I was like, I didn't know how much I cared. And I really do care. I love that the there are two female leads in this story who are strong females who have agency, who have brains and the ability to think for themselves. There are women in power in this world and just how refreshing to have this fantasy setting. This is a very like standard, typical fantasy style of book and how refreshing to see females in power, females with agency, females that are leads, females being equally strong as males. It was something I needed, let me tell you, and John Gwynn got it right. Another thing that I think he got right is his action. And I've sort of been that devil's advocate. Anytime people talk about John Gwynn's action being the best, I'm like, is it really though? Or have you just heard other people say that? Because I personally don't like malice in this book. No, like here I am eating my words. You all can be like, I told you so, Britt. And I'm like, you know what? You did and you're right. And I'm glad that I took a chance and picked this up because the action scenes were so good. And what I mean by that is I was able to picture the action and the battles that never happens. It is a sign of good action scenes when I don't glaze over and I can actually see what's happening. I do think the reason that his battle scenes or fights appealed to me is because they're kind of gory, not over the top, but he'll just straight up say how it is bluntly about somebody's head coming off or their intestines spilling out about the blood gushing out their neck. It's not too flowery and descriptive and convoluted it's just like oh okay yeah I cut their stomach and their intestines spilled out like it just says what it is even if it's gory and it makes me be like oh interesting okay there were also a lot of other visuals in this book that like borderlined on being horror elements that I liked there were certain scenes that even gave me like a Game of Thrones TV show vibes of being in the north with the winter setting so I don't know. I just, I really, 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 really liked my time. I am happy to say that I don't think this book is overhyped. I, I truly don't. And I was really worried going into it. I went into it with a completely open mind, just letting the book speak to me. Let John Gwynn tell me his tale. I really, truly think that this deserves every ounce of the hype that it's getting. Because like I said, I may have just said that Dreams of the Dying was my favorite start to a fantasy series this year, but that's a completely different type of fantasy story. And it's something that I can only take in little chunks because of how much it emotionally impacts me. This is like my perfect standard fantasy escapism. I want to read about some cool things happening and go to this world. It will be the one that I think I am most anticipating the sequel coming out to because I really feel like I can count on him to create a quality sequel. Also, we have lots of questions still. I won't say more than that, but especially by what happened at the end, the epic scenes at the end here, I need to know where we're going. Like John Gwen, what's in your mind? Because this is a lot of setup. This is a lot of establishment of these people and their backstories and the world that they live in. And I think things are going to kind of explode a bit. And the next book 
based on what happened in the end here. So this was more of a quiet story with some gory action scenes establishing the the world that we're about to get in the next installment. And I could just sing this book's praises for quite a while because that's how much I loved it. But what do you guys think of this? Okay, and then the last book that I read in the month of June and my favorite book of the month, even though I just gave that a five star, I just gave it a 4.75 and I really enjoyed it. It's because I'm biased and this series is just something I love so dearly. And that is Endymion by Dan Simmons, which I rated a 4.75 out of five stars because I didn't find it to be perfect, but my enjoyment level was the most out of everything I read this month. If you guys are sort of catching on to how I rate my books, <laughs> hopefully. So this is the third book in Hyperion Cantos, which takes place approximately 250 years after the fall of Hyperion. So of course, we're not following the same cast of characters. I won't say, hmm. I think you'll be happy and pleasantly surprised by the characters that are in this, but we really have a tonal shift in this book. It is not your urgent horror filled book like the first two are you don't have that on the edge of your seat feeling throughout the whole novel there's a lot of quiet slow paced moments of exploration so i can't say anything about the plot without spoiling things from the first two i will say there's a lot of chasing going on if you know anything about this world and getting from one planet to another there's a lot of world hopping going on I suppose in a chase so there's dual POVs between a priest and our main protagonist and his crew and it's really nice the way that Dan Simmons rotates the two POVs back and forth because it keeps you engaged it keeps you going he almost does this thing throughout part of the book where he spoils what's going to happen next by you seeing it from the one person first and then he'll go back and describe what happened I like that the chapters end on cliffhangers, so it keeps you turning the pages. But you need to know that it's not the same thing, and I don't like the amount of hate that Endymion gets, because as I said earlier, if you want to read the same exact thing in sequels, just go back and reread the books you loved. Like, I don't get why people want it to be Hyperion or Fall of Hyperion exactly. It's its own special thing that we are learning about. And what's really cool to me is we get to learn a lot about the world and we get to see and explore a lot of different places in this book. And I thought that was really fun because as somebody who is obsessed with Hyperion Cantos, I want more things like that. I want to be able to see some of these places that maybe we haven't seen yet in the story so far because the first two are pretty contained locations for the most part. I mean, not overall, but for the sake of not spoiling things. So Dan Simmons completely slayed the end of this book. Oh, when I got to the part, I think it's like the second or third to last chapter. And I was just like, yes, are you freaking kidding me? Yes. And then it's told in a really unique storytelling format where our main character is writing letters and he's talking directly to you at the beginning and at the end, not so much like in between. Um, so we get to learn some details about things we had questions about from the ending of book two. So you do get some answers to questions, but he tells you if you're reading this to find out answers, like the main character tells you in his letter, you're not going to get them. So you can't think that it's going to be a direct sequel wrapping everything up. I don't think that's what Simmons intended. You do still have really cool action scenes, really cool intense moments, sense of urgency, awesome world building. You have really tragic scenes sad moments where I was heartbroken. You have a little budding romance that I didn't hate. And if I didn't hate it, that's saying something. You have friendships. Oh, it's just, it's so beautifully done, well-crafted. I'm probably biased because of my love for Hyperion Cantos in general. Like I said, it's not a five-star book because of the pacing issues. There were some times that some of the chapters really got longer and it was just too much description of things I didn't care about maybe, like things that didn't overall impact the story that I think might have been able to be edited out. Um, but I personally didn't mind them. But trying to think about it from an outsider's perspective, I can see how someone might not love that. But 
I don't know, you guys, I just love this so much. And I can't wait to read the rise of Endymion in July. But I tell you, I will be devastated when these four books are finished. And then I can start working on Dan Simmons' other works because you guys never fail to tell me. And what I love is you guys all tell me different Dan Simmons books that are your favorites or that you love so much too. Some of you even like his other books more than Hyperion Cantos. So I am excited about having a new favorite author and just really loving everything that this man puts the pen to the page on. And there are, once again, beautiful themes, so many quotable lines in this book, dealing with themes of humanity and love and, oh, technology advancements, all the usual sci-fi elements that I love to explore within a story. So this was my favorite book that I read of the month, even though, truthfully, Endymion by Dan Simmons, The Shadow of the Gods by John Gwen and Dreams of the Dying by Nicholas Lietzo. They're basically all on the same level to me. I enjoyed all of them almost exactly the same. They're almost all five-star reads, so brilliantly done. These three books alone make me feel like I have the best reading month. If you can't tell, I get really super excited about what I read and I had a fabulous time. And trying to choose one between those three of my favorite of the month is just so, so hard. But like I said, I am most impressed with those starts to fantasy series and this third book in the sci-fi series that I'm reading. Okay, so let's just briefly talk about the two manga that I read this month. For the read-along on Billy Banzai's channel, I completed volume one of Berserk and I liked it. The character and his little companion that we meet in this novel are what's keeping me going. So it's pretty dark. There's a lot of bloodshed, a lot of graphic things that happen. And that's not what I was loving about this. And I think sometimes people get mixed up um, with what I see mean when I say I like dark fantasy. It's more so the aspects of mental health like within Dreams of the Dying rather than just like slaughter like Prince of Thorns Jorg. So I can tell that we're going to get some more information about what has happened in the past with our main character Guts and I'm really excited to see where that goes because within reading this first volume I was not able to fully get a grasp on what is going to happen and where we're going but I'm intrigued, I'm interested. So in July I'll be reading the next couple installments in this and I know that some of you guys have been wanting me to read this for so long now so it's finally time that I've picked it up and I'm really glad that I did so. I think I gave it a four out of five stars. And then I have My Hero Academia volume two which I am enjoying reading the manga more than I was watching the anime. I've said so many times on my channel that I have auditory sensory issues that don't allow me to sometimes watch anime because of the sounds. So I'm able to experience the story in a different format that works a little bit better for me. I'm also able to keep track of things a bit more easily reading the manga than I was throughout the TV show too. And I think it's because you can really pay attention to everything that's being said or who's saying it or what certain character names are because sometimes it goes so fast in the anime that I either forget or things are a little bit unclear. So I know I have so many to work my way through, but I'm really glad that I'm reading these and I can't wait to continue on with the My Hero Academia manga and finish the story out that way. I'm not sure I will complete the anime just for the reasons I said before, but I'm loving the manga. My throat hurts. <laughs> We've made it through June wrap up. I know this is really long, but there's timestamps that you guys can use per usual. So let's talk about what I read in the month of June. If you guys want to chat with me in the comments about what I had to say about some of these books, especially if you read any of the last three that were my favorite ones. Also, what was your favorite thing that you read in the month of June? Your favorite and least favorite, maybe whatever you guys want to tell me about your reading month in June. I would love to hear. Did you have a good reading month overall? I certainly hope so, but thank you guys for watching and I will see you next time. Mm -hmm.